Hello there, this is Grizzlies Maximus bringing you part 3 of the 2D dynamic lighting system tutorial. Now this is going to be a very special tutorial for we are going to be covering features that you guys have suggested. Yes, that's right. Here we have a preview of all those features. So we have ourselves some background layers from Game Maker Studio 2. We've got ourselves some triangular walls, some directional lights, some soft shadows, vibrant lights, and last but not least, normal mapping. So there's quite a lot for us to handle so let's begin now making these video tutorials is extremely difficult from making the code from talking in front of the camera while coding from video editing to all of the retakes that i've done i have taken days trying to make this so if you guys appreciate all the effort that i'm doing please do leave a like and subscribe if you do want to see more content just like this now the first feature comes from larry inc 64 and he asked if we can use the background layers of Game Maker Studio 2 to make our backgrounds. Now, last time I said that this is not possible, but I'm wrong. There is a way to do it. Now, Game Maker Studio 2 has offered us many features for our background. So let's enable our background first. And let's say we just add a sky to our background and we make it horizontal tile, vertical tile, and let's give it a horizontal speed of 0.5. Now, this is very easy for us to do using Game Maker Studio 2's features. And as you can see, we already got ourselves a working background that's moving. Now, the problem about this is obviously we don't want to be illuminating the sky. We only want to be illuminating the walls, not the sky. So there's something wrong with our light system. So that's what we're going to be fixing. So we want to distinguish sky from wall. And one way to do that is by setting the sky alpha to zero and setting the wall alpha to one. Now we can actually change the alpha by going to the color here and bring it all the way down to zero. And if we do that, we should see that the sky is now gone. So this doesn't solve the problem. Now, the reason why it's doing that is because the blend mode of the sky is BM normal, meaning that the source color is being multiplied by the alpha, which is zero, giving us nothing because zero multiplied by anything is zero. So what we're going to do instead is use the color right enable function. Now, we are going to be using this onto the layer itself. And this is a little bit tricky, but I'll be showing you step by step on how to do this. So first of all, let us revert this color back to alpha equals 255 to give it the full alpha rating. And then we're going to go to the object setup. Let's go to create, go down somewhere here, just put it anywhere you want. Now, what we want to do is that we want to be finding the layer ID of the background. And to do that, we're just going to be setting a variable. Let's just make it a local variable. When you say BG layer and we say equals to layer get id and here we get the id and we say background so make sure that what you're writing here is the same label as the labels here next we want to be saying layer script begin and here we're going to say bg layer and then we're going to be saying let's say bg begin now this is a function that we're going to be declaring so we just say here function bg begin so make sure that this bg begin is the same as this bg begin there we go and then here we're going to be setting the gpu set color right enable here we're going to be saying one 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 zero these are the r g and b colors and the a we are going to be drawing the r g and b values but we're not going to be touching the alpha the next thing we want to do is we want to be copying this and we paste this here and then we say end layer script end and then instead of bg begin we say bg end and then we're just going to be copying this again paste this here change this begin to end and then instead of gpu color right enable 1110 we say 1111 we do this so then we can revert back to default now if we run the game we would see that the sky is once again missing now the reason why it's missing is because when we draw the application surface to the screen we are drawing it with a blend mode of BM normal. That means that anything with an alpha equal to zero, like the sky, would not be drawn. So in order to fix this, we would need to be changing the blend mode to something else. So let's do that. Let's go to object setup here, and we go to post draw. This is where we draw the application surface to the screen. So before we do that, let's say GPU set blend mode extension, we say BM1, and then BM0. What it does is that it replaces the source with the destination. And then don't forget to say GPU set blend mode at the end to BM normal to 
again bring it back to default. And then if we run the game, we would see that the sky is once again there. But again, we are drawing the lights on the sky. We didn't solve the problem. It looks like we went back to square one. But we haven't because now the sky is actually with an alpha equals to zero, whereas the wall has an alpha equals to one. All we need to do now is utilize this. So what we're going to do is that we're going to be blending the light surface with the application surface is alpha. That way, any light that is on top of the sky will be discarded. So to do that, we're going to go to the draw event and then right after we draw all these lights, we are going to be first saying shader reset because we don't want to be drawing it with the shader light. Now, we're going to be saying here GPU set blend mode extension to BM0 because we don't want to be drawing the application surface and then we're going to be saying BM source alpha. So we are going to be blending the alpha of the application surface. So we say draw surface, application surface, drawn at VX, VY. But because of the blend mode, we're only be drawing, we're only blending the alpha to the destination, which is the light surface. Now, we're not done yet. We need to be changing this blend mode here. So instead of blending it the source color to the destination we're going to be blending the destination color to the source so these two are actually the same thing so we say bm destination color this is practically the same thing as bm source color in the destination because we want to be changing this to bm inverse destination alpha so essentially this part here is drawing the walls whereas this part here is drawing the sky so if we run the game we would see that it's actually working. The walls are being lit up by the lights, whereas the sky is fully illuminated at all times, just as we wanted to. But there's a problem. If we were to compare it with the sky color, we would see that the game sky color is a little bit brighter than the original sky color. So there's something wrong happening here. The reason why that's happening is because when we draw our shad surface, we are drawing it to the alpha of 0.8. So we're going to be removing the 0.8 and make it alpha equal to the 1 by doing so. We just do that and then we just say draw surface. As simple as that. And then we're going to be removing these shaders because we don't need them. So you might be wondering, didn't those shaders do something? And the answer is yes. It was giving us that dimly lit effect in our walls. Because right now, anything that's not being lit by our light is just completely black. So how do we fix this problem without using those shaders? Well, there's a very simple trick. Instead of putting C black here and draw clear alpha, we just say C dark gray. And as simple as that, we now have dimly lit walls. So I'm going to be expanding this further by adding a secondary background. Now I know some of you guys do this, so I'm going to be showing it to you guys. So let's add a secondary background and let's give it a name of background 2. And then we're going to be setting this to sprite clouds. Now this is different from the sky because this one is just the clouds, no sky. Now, we're going to be setting the offset to 100, the Y offset, so then we can differentiate it from the clouds behind it. And then we're going to be saying horizontal tile and vertical tile. And we're going to give a horizontal speed of 0.75. Now, if you run the game, we would see that the secondary background is working, but it's being illuminated by our light. So there's still something wrong. How do we solve this? Well, it's actually very simple. All we have to do is just go to the assets. And we go to the object setup here, we go to the create, and instead of doing this, we just copy and paste these, and then we just say background 2, BG layer 2, and then here in the end, just the end, we say BG layer 2. And if we run this, well, we practically just fixed the problem. Now we can actually add background 3, background 4, or not just background, we can add any kind of layer, an instance layer, a tile layer, and this would still work. As long as the last background is this guy here and the first background or first layer rather is this guy here. So we're done with the backgrounds. Let's move on to creating triangular walls. Now this has been suggested by Rookstar from itch.io. So thank you very much for the suggestion. Now creating triangle walls is very similar to creating the rectangular walls that we have done so far. So let's recall on how to create those. Now imagine this is our rectangular wall. Now, the way we cast shadows is by using the two diagonals. Now, this is obviously more efficient than if we use the four sides. Now, 
with triangles, we're going to be doing something similar. We are going to have this triangle here, and then we're going to be getting the midpoint, and then we're going to have three shadow casters connected like so. Now, you might be thinking that this isn't very efficient. I mean, if we use the sides, we'll be having the same amount of shadow casters. Now, there is a reason why we are connecting it to the middle, and that's because we want to be implementing edge lighting in the later tutorial. So, more on that later. I hope you're going to be excited when that comes out. Anyways. So what we're going to do is that we're going to be creating an object. So we create an object and we call this object try. Now we're going to be giving it a sprite of SPR try. Now normally you don't want to be putting your textures as your sprites. You just want to be having a placeholder just like our wall here. So then you can stretch it out. And then the textures are going to be placed as your tiles. So I'm just being lazy here. So the texture and the sprite are just one and the same for the object try. So we're going to be creating an create event and in this create event we are going to be storing the coordinates of that midpoint. So to get the midpoint, let's look at our diagram here again. Now this point here will have a value of x, y and then this value here will have a value of x, y plus h and then this one here will have a value of x plus w, y plus h. Now, to get this midpoint, it's essentially grabbing all of these points here and then averaging them. So, if you get the average of all the x's, that will be 1, 2, 3 x's, so that will be 3 x plus this w here. So, plus w, and then we divide all this by 3. Now, for the y value, we're going to be getting all the y's here, so that's 1, 2, 3 y's, so that's again 3 y's plus 1, 2 h's. So that will be plus 2 h. And we're going to get all this and divide it by 3. By the way, w and h is width and height if you didn't notice. Now, let's go back to our code here, mid x. And we're going to be saying this is going to be equals to 3 x, 3 times x, this is not algebra, plus sprite width. And then we're going to be dividing it by 3. Now, we're going to be copying this and pasting this for mid y, and it's basically the same thing, except that instead of 3 times x, we're going to say 3 times y, and then we're going to say 2 times sprite height. And we're done with the mid x and mid y. So now we go to object setup, and here in the step event, just like object wall, we are going to be creating some quads. Now, these are our shadow casters, so we're going to be saying with object try. And we're going to be saying, we're going to be copying these quads here. So we're going to be copying this and pasting. Now instead of this x sprite sprite weird, we're going to be saying mid x and mid y. So here, mid y. We're going to be copying this again three times. So one, two, three. And then instead of x, y, we're going to be using these coordinates of these three corners. So the first one will be x, y. The second one will be x, y plus sprite height. And then the next one will be x plus sprite width and then y plus sprite height. Let's put go to the room event, I mean the room, and we are going to be, put it in the instance layer, we're going to be dropping this try right here and we're going to be running the game. Now if we go down here, we would see that our triangle is illuminating and casting shadows properly. Now. You might be thinking, well, we just made one orientation. What about the other triangle orientations? Well, I have to tell you that this code that we created works for all. So let's say we have this triangle here and then we change the orientation to look downwards. We have this triangle here. We change the orientation so then it's a sideways. We got this triangle here and we just do the complete opposite like so. You would see that again, this triangle works and these three triangles also work. Look at that. Look at that. They are all working with that one simple code. So we're done with our triangular walls. Now let's move on to directional lights. Now this has been suggested by Jacob Mandak. So thank you very much, Jacob, for your suggestion. So to create directional lights, it looks like a regular light, but we just get a slice. So imagine that this is our slice here. Now to make this slice, we would need two things. We would need the direction which is where the light is facing and we'll need the FOV to determine how big the slice is. What we're going to be doing is that we're going to be taking the half of the FOV. So this is H FOV. Now H FOV represents the distance, the angular distance away from the direction before the light cuts off. So it's important for us to be working on H FOV. 
So to start off, let's go to our object light. And then we're going to go to variable definitions and we're going to be adding two more variables. So the first one will be called dire and the next one will be called FOV. Now these two variables will have a range of 0 to 360 degrees. So make sure you check the use range. Now don't forget to make the FOV in a range of let's say 69. Now we go to the object setup here and we go to our create. And then here in the create function, we are going to be making some more of these uniform shaders. So here we say we do it as twice and then instead of USDR, we say U direction and U FOV. And then we're just going to copy this and paste this here, copy this and paste this here. And we're basically done for this part, but we still need to go to the draw. So same thing, we're going to be copying this guy here and then we're going to be pasting it twice. And then we're going to be saying U direction, U FOV is going to be equals to U direction, U FOV. And then here, down here, we're going to be copying again these two guys here. Let me just copy this guy here and make it double. And then we say U FOV, FOV, direction, and direction. So we're done with this part. So let's proceed to the shaders. So we go to the shaders, we go to the shader light. And then here in the shader light, we are going to go to the fragment shader. And then here, we're going to be defining define pi. So we need to do this to so say 3.14159265388. Hopefully that's the correct pi definition. And then here in the uniform floats, we'll add some more uniform floats. So we say uniform float U F O V. Let me just copy this. And then we make the next one direction. So down here in the main, we're going to be adding some floats. So we say float direction is going to be equals to radians U direction. Now we're trying to convert our directions and FOV to radians because we are going to be doing some calculations in radians. So the next one is going to be float H FOV. So we're not going to be getting the FOV but the H FOV which is going to be radians U FOV and we're going to be multiply this by 0.5. This is going to be the half of the FOV and then we're going to be saying if H FOV is less than pi or less than 180 degrees that means that we are not going to be slicing anything. So if we're not going to be slicing anything, we're just going to ignore this and go proceed to the GL frag column. Now, if we are going to be slicing things, the first thing we need to do is find the angle of our pixel in the fragment shader. So we're going to be saying float rad is going to be equal to a tangent. And then we're going to be saying this dot y and then this dot x. Now, this this dot y and this dot x comes from this distance here. This is the distance of our current position from the center of our light. Now take note that we're going to change this to negative this dot y and the reason is because when we're dealing with angles, positive y direction is upwards whereas in gaming studio, positive y direction is downwards. So we need to be reversing this so then we be according to the angular convention. Now we're going to be making a new float and we're going to call this a distance. Now this a distance is the angular distance from the direction. That we are in so we're going to be saying rad minus the direction as simple as that now we're going to be getting the abs of this so that we don't get any negatives and then take note that this rad here is from negative pi to positive pi that's the range of this result whereas our directions remember we got the radians this is from zero to two pi so we are in different range areas so what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be changing this rad to be in the same range as this direction. So to do that, we are going to be saying mod rad and then we're going to be saying 2 times pi. Now, because this rad can be negative and when we take the module of a negative number, weird things happen. We need to be adding 2 pi here to ensure that it's going to be a positive number. But because we're adding 2 pi here and we're moduloing it by 2 pi, we will know that this thing was still going to give us the same results. Now make sure that we're going to be adding decimal points to our twos or else we're going to get an error. And then we're going to be saying a distance is going to be equal to the minimum of a distance or 2 dot times pi minus a distance. And the reason why we're doing this is because let's say, say we have a 0 degrees and this is our direction which is 270 degrees now our a distance is getting this 
This is our A distance right now, but we don't want to be getting this. We want to be getting this smaller angle here, which is 90 degrees. So, going back to this equation here, this 2 pi minus A distance is this 90 degrees. So now that we got this A distance, we are going to go and ask ourselves if A distance is greater than the half of the FOV or H FOV. If so, then we're going to be saying that the strength will be equal to zero. And if we run the game, we would see that we got ourselves some working directional light. Now let's go and change our light. So we go to object light here and we change the, let's say the direction. Let's just grow it somewhat 115 degrees. And we would see that it's now facing a different direction. Let's say we say another direction, let's say 305 and we run the game and we see now it's facing downwards. Now let's say we change the FOV, let's say we make it 221. And now we have ourselves a very large light that's not even more directional, that's pretty big. Now if you notice, our lights have a very harsh edge. Now normally, lights in real life have soft edges, not hard edges, so we're going to be trying to fix that. So here we're going to go back to shader light and instead of this if statement here, we're going to be replacing this with SDRs equals to the clamp of 1 minus A distance divided by the HFOV from 0 to 1. Now, what this does is that if the A distance is less than the HFOV, meaning that we're within the range, then this thing is going to be a value less than 1. And so 1 minus something less than 1 will be a value from 0 to 1. Now, if the A distance is greater than the HFOV, this thing will be greater than 1 and anything 1 minus something greater than 1 will be a negative number. So the clamp would make this 0, and so the SDR will be 0. If we run this, let's see how it looks like. We're going to be getting some kind of soft lighting. So anything that's greater than the A distance will be 0, and then as we go closer to the middle, it gets stronger and stronger. Now, I do find this very, very soft. So what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be grabbing this whole entire thing here, and then we're going to, going to be multiplying it by 5. Now, you could multiply it by any number, but 5 seems to be working for me. And this gives me the best result of something that's a little bit soft, but a little bit hard in the same time. It's just the correct mix. Now that we have soft lighting, if we were to put our light behind this wall, notice how harsh the shadows are compared to the light. So we need to be fixing those shadows. We need to make those shadows as soft as our light. Now, creating soft shadows is a lot more complicated and... Since we don't really have much time left, I think it's about time that we wrap things up. So we'll be continuing on with the soft shadows, the vibrant lights, and the normal mapping in the later tutorial. I'll also be talking about the bloom effect and the edge lighting in another tutorial. So please hit that subscribe button if you don't want to miss those tutorials. And if you like this video, please do leave a like if you like. Thank you guys for watching and hope to see you guys next time.